Probably some text or something. Like Yeah, sure. Like yeah, that's yeah, that's good. Good. Thanks. Right. So good evening, everyone. Um, and I'm really sorry for uh, the delay. Therefore, I really just uh, 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 you know, as they say, the shortest chutbah is the best chutbah. I will be as short as possible. So we are really honored um, uh, for having uh, Professor Nadine and Lucia Day here in uh, SFU uh, this workshop, and she's already been uh, uh, with us uh, uh, during the paper presentations. She's going to talk about uh, language of difference in Islamic Eurasia, which is sort of a, you know, also a, uh, coming out of his has uh, recently won the prestigious uh, Dr. Prize of the World History Organization. So thanks, Nile, and you know, without further ado. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's this beautiful room, and, uh, and I've just been introduced by Ferenc, who I've learned today he was going to take Islamic, Eur Islamic Eurasia to my home city of Birmingham, expanding those frontiers. So that's very exciting. Congratulations on, on the new job. So um, I'm talking today then about a specific word or the shift really from the term but in Persian uh, to something more specific then, Buddha, than from a generic to a more specific conception of the Buddha. And I'm going to start with uh, an intellectual puzzle that drove me about 10 years ago to be thinking uh, about this question. Since I was that since so many of us know about the, the classic medieval Arabic Persian accounts of the Buddha, that somehow there was some kind of thing, general knowledge about Buddhism across the Islamic world that survived from these medieval, particularly Mongol period contacts, or maybe even before. And that certainly in somewhere like India, as late as the 19th century, one might assume some very basic, at least, knowledge, general the Buddha or Buddhism. So when I read this Urdu text from 1893 by an educated author, an alim who knows, studied Arabic and Persian, writes the book in Urdu, goes to Burma and studies Pali and Burmese. And despite the title, Sayyidi Burma, this is actually a book about the religion of Burma. And yet what struck me, really like a thunderbolt, that he has not only no conception of a religion of Buddhism, or even such a person as a, as a Buddha, but not even a name for this religion. He simply calls it the Mazhabi Badama, the religion of Burma. When he learns through learning Burmese and Pali, he learns that the founder of this religion is someone called Shin Gotama. He has no sense that this is the historical Gotama, the Buddha, grew up about 70 miles away from his hometown in North India. And this struck me then as a, as a puzzle. How Late as the seven, as the 1890s, someone so educated from this region of India would have no word, let alone a conception or a history of this religion just across the, uh, the Bay of Bengal in Burma. So this leads me then to my to my question today: to Buddha, How did a generic term, the Persian and the Urdu term, but etymologically way back, coming from the Sanskrit term? enlightened where we get the word Buddha, but having just become a generic term for an idol. And how do we get a shift then from the generic term to what we would think of as now is assume when we go to Iran or India or anywhere, there are books on Buddhism. This is not sort of, this is just a, a known thing. So how did this generic term then, the Buddha, the idol, regain its specificity? How was knowledge of the Buddha recovered, regained, or indeed perhaps of course, if it's regained, we're assuming it was there to begin in the beginning. So 
following the method really in, in, in my recent book, what I'm really doing here is the evidence rather than assuming that there was some kind of cultural memory floating around in people's minds of the educated, let alone the uneducated. I've been trying to piece together the textual evidence of uh, knowledge of the historical Buddha or indeed of a shift from discussions and descriptions of generic books to a more specific historical figure of Gautama, the Buddha. And one of the things this has really sort of led me to think a great deal in this book, How Asia Found Herself, is the, the real barriers uh, between languages and particularly between different scripts. And a larger struggle that various scholars have looked at of commensurability, of trying to explain uh, one philosophical or theological system in the terms of a but it's also brought me a renewed awareness of not just the, the concept of memory, which as scholars, as historians, we're so much aware of, but also much less uh, considered or theorized historical process of memory loss, of forgetting, not just knowledge, but knowledge that's lost. So there's medieval texts that I'll speak of, that we all know of, Rashid ad-Din and others. What's the process by which those texts are forgotten? paradigms that I explored, at least in the introduction to my book, were what I call the silk mode model of continuity. The assumption then that, that knowledge from certain Silk Road Eurasian connections was handed down continuously and remembered. Another problem with the back projection of later knowledge, as we'll see by the 1900s, 1910s, 20s, there's a very considerable amount of knowledge of the historical Buddha in Islamic languages. But we shouldn't project back that 20th century knowledge, perhaps even as recently as the 1890s, let alone to centuries beforehand. Another issue, so much of the, in the last 20, 30 years, the shift of cosmopolitanism, I think, of interreligious discussions, I think has uh, hidden the actual problems, not only of commensurability, but actually of the theological problems and theological concerns of various people who did write as Muslims about other religions. So I'm working then in within in line with a sort of a, a, a what I call the, the new Islamic at intellectual history of scholars who are working with Islamic languages and source materials, but looking at uh, whether in Stefan Kamola's book on Rashid ad-Din and his Jamia Tawarikh, or indeed Ahmed Shamsi's work on the interplay between European Orientalist and various Egyptian scholars on rediscovering the Islamic classics, Arabic texts that had laid in manuscript but not read certainly not circulated for centuries. Matthew King's recent book on the rediscovery in the 19th century of the fourth century pilgrim, Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Fa Xian's record of uh, the Buddhist kingdoms, uh, uh, an account of Buddhist India that was then rediscovered and recirculated from uh, China via Paris across Mongolia, Tibet, and then back to China in the 19th and 20th century, and my own recent book building on so an outline of what I'm going to do. First of all, I'm going to sketch, I'm sure what most of us, if not all of us already know, the Islamic language of idols. Then I'm going to turn to looking at a few of these well-known medieval and early modern accounts. I'll problematize the transmission, the continued memory, as this thing from the forgetting of these accounts. And then look at this moment, this period of the rediscovery, or indeed perhaps for many people, the plain discovery of uh, regions idols, but indeed that this specific idol and indeed a particular religion, and more than a religion of idolatry then, the discovery uh, of Buddhism being in South Asia, but also other regions of Eurasia and beyond in Japan, they're taking us then from the generic bud, from the language of idolography, writing about idols, to actually writing about a particular religion and a historic Buddha. So the Quranic terminology then, which of course is, is extremely right up to the present day, as we'll see in, a, in the, one of the last texts I'll, I'll refer to, of the, the Sanam, the Asnam, or the Watan and the Authan, particularly coming up in the Quranic accounts of Ibrahim's pagan adversaries, that the idol worshippers then as being sort of the really opposite of what Abraham and the predecessors of the prophet uh, are, are about. So the, the, the Quranic and then in the Kalam literature and the theological literature, the Sanam as idol, is problematic. It has a negative theological valence. But then we have the post-Quranic then, 
Arabic term, again, taken from the Buddha, but simply coming into Arabic as meaning a generic idol, again, the Bud or the Bidada in the plural. But we have a whole text then written about what I call idolography, descriptions of idols, sometimes in some detail. Hisham ibn Kalbi's Kitab al-Asnam, perhaps the earliest uh, of, of the genre of what I'm calling idolography, description in detail of the idols of the pre-Islamic Arabs. Then various belletrists and travel and geographical writers, al-Jahiz, al-Masudi, Ibn Shahriyan, the Kitab Ajab al-Hind, and here too, accounts of uh, the Bud simply become a generic idol. And again, this is a, a point I make against the, the scholarship on cosmopolitanism. It's actually the most, it's actually the heresiographical text, the heresiographers. My character goes to in the 19th century, learns Pali and Burmese in order to be able to confute the teachings of the Buddha to save the souls of those mistaken followers of the religion of Burma. So it's not in a sense the cosmopolitans, unless we use the word differently. It's the heresiographers who have the most detailed accounts of, well, not just of a bird, of an idol, but Shahristani gives us the most detailed account in any of the medieval sources, far more than Al-Biruni, for example, of the followers of a distinct religion, or indeed at least a school called uh, of the followers of the Buddha. So moving from the Arabic language to, or the Ar Arabic model to what I call the Persian or the Persianate model, so the Persian term, but then again, as we've seen, etymologically related to the term Buddha, but just becoming used by the emergence really of effectively of, of Persian poetry, and certainly by the Hasnavid period in poets like Farukhi Sistani, Masud Sad Salman, writing in, in the latter case in, uh, in, in India, in, in uh, Lahore, writing a great deal about the generic but. And, but this is now, not a negative theological valence. This isn't the, the, the Bud, the idol of the Kala theology literature. This is the Buti Mahrui, the moon-faced idol, a figure of beauty and so on, with all the metaphors that come, the Bud Khani Achin. So China associates with the end of idolatry, but in this positive aesthetic valence that the idol is given here. We also have texts of poetic idolography then, the Somnatia section, Sa'ad is Bustan. And here what's interesting too is the, the uh, Somnatia here, the term Somnat, the famous temple in Gujarat, name Somnat is taken by al Ghazi, the uh, Ghaznavid era historian who, upon whom Saadi apparently relied, as actually Somnat being derived from the name Manat of one of the idols of the Kaaba, who had been taken and stored then in India where they would continue to worship. So, uh, again, here, this is, you know, this is say, even though this is about a burden and a positive valence of a, of a but, this is being drawn into not a sense of the religion of Buddhism, but actually within sort of a cultural memory based upon the pre Islamic uh, idols, the Asnam of the Kaaba. We have 18th century texts then from Varanasi, including by Hindus, then with a more positive accounts of, of idols and more specific idols here. But of course, these are Hindu idols, not. Buddhist uh, religious figures. The memory of Buddhism then has been forgotten in India, effectively by Hindu as well as Muslim uh, scholars and writers. So what we're seeing then so far, and what I want to sketch out in some more detail then, is a loss, indeed simply a plain absence, loss assuming that it was there to begin with. And as I say, apart from Shahrastani, we don't really have any detailed accounts of, of, uh, the, of what Buddhism even indeed for particular something we might call Buddhism. So the loss or simply the absence of specificity, especially in this idolographic literature, writing about idols as distinct from the heresiographers who are interested in not just idols, but what people think, theology of uh, the followers of uh, the Buddha. But moreover, the most abundant, at least it seems to me, I'd be interested to hear what Devon says from the Central Asia uh, uh, primary sources. But it seems to me that the most abundant site specific references to idols, of so descriptions of a particular idol in a particular temple, or a particular but with a name, and it's this god or that deity or the other. These are located in India and are Indian gods, rather than actually, let's say, the various bodhisattvas, of course, in, in, in the various versions of Burma, whether Burmese historically in Tibetan, of course, there are many, many different statues. We don't have that specificity 
in the Persian or the Arabic language uh, text of idols. We only have that mostly for Hindu ones. And when we have this cosmopolitan, when we do have cosmopolitan figures, famously Dada Shukou, of course, in the Mughal period, we have a focus on theological similarity, not actually on idols, because the problem of idol worship, which is there for Al-Biruni, which is there for Shahristani, Al-Biruni Al -Biruni and the figures who are sympathetic towards Indian scholars and Indian intellectuals, the Muwahiduni Hind, the Unitarians of India, as Dada Shukou will call them, they're okay because they, they don't worship idols. They're actually Unitarians, really. And so when we have the cosmopolitan appreciation, let's say, of, of the Hindus, that's because those Hindus don't worship idols. So if you see where I'm going here, the cosmopolitanism actually sidesteps the real theological problem of idolatry, which is there, in a sense, sort of in the... The, the discursive as well as the theological DNA of the Islamic tradition here of ideology. And yeah, we also have these Eurasian intellectual barriers. By the time that we, by let's say the medieval period, Buddhism has historically disappeared from India and Buddhist texts then are in a whole series of more complicated languages of which we have this, whether Chinese or Burmese, which we're simply not having translations from from Chinese into Arabic in a very significant way. Again, not until, let's say, the Han Kitab syllabus, and then these are Confucian and Islamic rather than Buddhist. Again, this issue of memory loss, of forgetting again, which I want to unpack some more. So the famous moment, when everyone reads anything about Islam and Buddhism, one's going to uh, get reference to the Jami Tawarikh, always uh, uh, attributed to to, uh, to Rashid ad-Din, but in Gamola's work has now demonstrated that the third volume of the Jami on India and the Buddha was probably written by, by, uh, by someone else, Abdullah Kashani. But this famous moment then of the Mongol awareness of Buddha, the account of, of Shakmuni, as he's called, and this is from the Arabic version then, and we can see Shakmuni uh, there on, on the slide. Well, a few things. First of all, this famous image as studied by Sheila Canby, the art historian, this only exists in one unique manuscript, an Arabic translation of the, uh, the Jami Tawarikh. Moreover, it's not clear how much the third volume of the Jami on India and include on India and China, including the Buddha, ever circulated very far at all, perhaps in Timurid Herat. Um, but it's not very clear how much it circulated beyond that. So it's hard to generalize then a continued memory from this uh, Mongol, famous Mongol moment. Nonetheless, it is an extremely important breakthrough text. It's no wonder that so many world historians have looked at the Jami Tawarikh. There's this section then in the third volume on India, the section on India that describes the life and teachings of Shakmuni, an account that the, the followers of Oshakmuni taught him about there were various hells, various heavens, that there was the reincarnation, metempsychosis, tanosuch, the various schools that developed from Shakmuni's teachings. And as it's been uncovered by various scholars in recent years, this comes from an intermediary Kamlashri, a Kashmiri Buddhist. And it's been discussed and debated by Sheila Kanbi and others whether that famous image that we just looked at was derived from a Chinese or a Kashmiri original. So it's a really important moment. But nonetheless, as I say, the, the issue of the continuity or the handing down the reception of that much rarer third volume dealt with India. As for Ibn Battuta, of course, our other famous medieval Eurasian cosmopolitan, well, he has relatively little as well on, on Buddhism. Even when he goes to Sri Lanka, Salon Sarandip, he's interested in, in uh, uh, Jabal Adam, Adam's Peak. And there's not a reference there to the belief of local Buddhists that it's the large footprint of, of, uh, of the Buddha there. And in his account of, uh, of China, another, let's say, part of, uh, of Eurasia, where there's obviously a large surviving Buddhist tradition through the Muslim period, his account uh, is simply that I mean, the Chinese themselves are infidels who worship idols and burn their dead like Hindus. He'd come from India, from China. So what we have here then is on the one is an echo of Ad-Biruni's chapter, because Ad-Biruni explores 
the, the teachings of the Hindus through uh, Vaisnava Brahmin seem to be his interlocutors, but has no really sense of Buddhism. For Ali Biruni, uh, the only mention that at least I could find in Ali Biruni, India, of Al Bud, the Buddha, is Wa Amasanam Jin Wahu Al Bud, and of the statue or of the I Jin, Jina, he is Buddha. So this isn't Buddha as being separated as a different religion. This is Bud, an idol, who is the same as Jin, Jina, who is another idol. So Al-Biruni and then, indeed, is, is this kind of problem with idolatry. And we see that echoed there in Batuta, the, the legal concept, the problem of Ibadat al-Asnam, of, of, of worshipping idols. That's there, too. They worship idols. That's what the Chinese do, according to Well, the next breakthrough moment that I'm aware of, at least, is Abul Fazl in the famous Aini Abdi. And there, again, we have a figure identified among the various Hindu schools then, also a figure known as here as not Shakmuni, but as Buddha, but also called Shakmuni. He's located here, in this case, in India. He lives in India. So we have you know, a relatively detailed account here, not as detailed as the Jemi uh, Tawarikh, but still. Of course, behind this text, we have the huge state resources. Abul Fazl was the vizier of the Mongol em Mughal Empire. And we have presumably bilingual Sanskrit reading, Persian writing, Munshis. The sources of Aini Akbari, I don't know. I'd be very interested to know if anybody knows. I couldn't find this. Perhaps Rashid ad -Din? And if not, or Rashid ad -Din and, surely Hindu heresiographers, because by this point in, in India, what cultural or indeed memory there is of Buddhism is through Sanskrit, Hindu, Vaishnava, heresiographies of the Buddha as the great heretic of Asian Indic religious tradition. More recently, Arish Khazani and Thibaut Duber have, have, have discovered these fascinating Persian texts in the 1780s sponsored by the India Company scholars, these Anglo-Persian collaborations, as Thibaut called them. And these are indeed Burmese Buddhist translations into Persian. But the problem is with these, with the sole manuscripts of them seem to have sat for the last 250 years in the Asiatic Society of Bengal. So again, we can't assume the circulation of knowledge of these, and they still haven't been printed to this day. So that issue then of non-circulation, of really, we all know the problem of readership or reception of any of the texts we look at, it's the big bugbear, isn't it, the big mystery. And certainly more research is needed on this. And, you know, we have Nir here, who's had a book forthcoming on these manuscript publication and really thinking this through. But more particularly then for my focus here on notions of, of the historical Buddha, the Shakyamuni, the Dibitawarikh, the Aini Akbari, we need really more research on copies, colophons, who owned them, ownership marks, citations, to know at least from some other texts was the Aini Akbari or the Jamitawarikh read. My initial findings are actually really quite skeptical about that, leading me to this next moment, what my book's really focused upon, the rediscovery of these Islamic age classics, these Muslim accounts of, of, uh, of Buddhism in the 19th and particularly the 20th century, and a series of independent discoveries, such as the figure I was talking about who went to Burma. So I won't go through this list, but it's kind of interesting to see this, the kind of stuff that uh, um, that Ahmad Shams has looked at with regard to Egypt of what he called the rediscovery of the Arabic classics. That when we look at these various Islamic age classics, as I'm calling them, the Jamia Tawarikh or the Aini Akbari, Ibn Battuta, they're what we when they do, when we know they start to circulate through print, that happens through these collaborations with European Orientalists. But even then, too, we can't assume that it's actually the Buddhist bits that circulate. So when the Jami Tawad is printed in Paris and then Kazan, the focus is here on the history of the Mongols, the first two volumes, not the third one in India. When, the, when it's finally printed somewhere in the Middle East, Bahman Academy's edition, at least the copies I could find, it's only the first two volumes again dealing with Iran and the Mongols, not with India and China. So even in the 20th century, by the 1930s, the, the Jami Tawadis account of Buddha isn't circulating widely. Um, Similarly, then, with the, the uh, Said Ahmad Khan, Prince the Aini Akbari, in collaboration with the Delhi Historical, the Delhi Archaeological Society, which has been founded with some company scholars at the same time. And one could go on, uh, on and on. 
of, uh, of Ibn al kalbis Kitab al-Asnan, then, was discovered in a un unique manuscript that he found on, on sale in Damascus then and brought to light in 1905, suggesting, again, we can't assume continued knowledge. That might be there. But I, you know, for me now, I want to see the evidence of, of a continued memory rather than, oh, yeah, after Jumeir Tariq, people knew about the Buddha. Here I'm building on again, as I say, this new Eurasian intellectual history of this Muslim reception of Orientalism, the work of Omar Riyad and, and Suzanne Hedgel, Ahmad Shams, as I've mentioned, and this Matthew King, who, whose book I referenced earlier. And again, this uh, edition and translation from classical Chinese of, um, of the uh, account of uh, Fasian, the Chinese Buddhist pilgrim of the, of, of the Buddhist kingdoms of India, that's translated into French, published in 1936 in Paris, and then subsequently translated and rediscovered, translated into Tatar, into Mongolian, into Tibetan, and then into Chinese to be printed again. So again, these texts are sort of lain dormant and, unfor and forgotten for a long time. And we bring that, I think, in the Islamic case as well. So I'll turn to a few case studies then of this second period then this period of the rediscovery of the Buddha as such, not just then the language of ideography and Buddha, but actually a shift then from Buddha to Buddha. But this is by no means a kind of a clear and easy, uh, certainly not a teleology. There were even by the late, early 20th centuries, we don't need to know, there were destructions of idols and indeed books of idolography still being written. But my first case study then I'll be looking at the Bay of Bengal. So that region then of Eurasia then, which has often been seen as the closest point of connection between the Islamic and the Chinese world, apart from perhaps one might say within China, which I'll turn to in a moment. So going back to the person who puzzled me to begin with, Abdul Khalik. What's extraordinary then here is we have a text that goes beyond ideology. He's not actually interested in books. He's interested in the actual beliefs, the theology of the people who follow the Mazhabi Burma, the religion of Burma, which, as I said, he calls it for the lack of a term for the religion, which is completely unknown to him, and he assumes unknown to his Indian readers as well. He learns, uh, he learns Burmese and Pali. I might to check this because the various transliterated names of texts that I sent to a scholar of Burmese. And he said, yeah, these are well-known text of the Burmese and Pali Tipitaka uh, canon of the, the, uh, the Theravada, Burmese Theravada uh, Buddhist canon. We have there his transcription of the Burmese alphabet there into showing pronunciations in, in, uh, in Arabic script in Urdu. And he learns this language to explain that the religion of Burma, explaining that the founder is this figure, Shin Gotama. So we will say, well, yeah, sure, that's Gotama, the historical Buddha. But because we have that background knowledge, some connection, he doesn't. So he explains that this Shin Gotama lived, well, it's not clear, perhaps a couple of centuries before the time of the Prophet Muhammad. All sorts of similarities with names of the various incarnations, the Pahasyas, he uses a Burmese word, the incarnations of this Buddha, which seem to have names that some of them, one of them looks like the Dajjal. Was the Muslim Antichrist. Uh, this Shin Gotama is said to have come from China, not ironically from 70 miles up the road from hometown in, uh, in the, the Nepalese borderlands. But nonetheless, this is not someone who, this is not an act of ignorance. This is an act of profound investigation. He's learning about Buddhism, learning about this unknown religion, not even named for, from scratch. It's an extraordinary text, an extraordinary achievement. And it goes beyond ideology. I, I, He's most concerned then with what these people who follow the religion of Bur Burma believe. And he finds that they believe in Tanasukh, one of the great heresies of the medieval Islamic texts in reincarnation. And he explains then to various Burmese uh, followers of the religion who become his, his uh, in a sense, his uh, debating opponents in a series of, uh, of public debates. He was relying upon their common human reason on their act. But this isn't a denigrating text in a sense. It's assuming universal reason. But he wants to save them from the moral horror of reincarnation. A whole series of examples he gives of, well, what if you, 
what if your father is reborn and your and your father your sister your father's daughter is reborn and then they meet and fall in love and marry this is horrible this is unthinkable some of the classic sort of muslim moral objections to the doctrine of reincarnation why would a good god or good principle behind the universe devise such a devilish system use reason to overcome that so this is what is interesting is going beyond ideology to use reason to engage in the language in the burmese language with these other fellow human beings who have universal reason. Yet a mere 20, well, 27 years later, is it 1921? Well, whatever that is, 21, 28 years later, another North Indian alim, a North Indian scholar from a similar background goes to Burma. And yet by this point in his text, there's a whole series of detailed information about the historical Buddha. It's taken for granted that readers will know about him. He explains how the religion of Buddhism, the religion of the Buddha came from its Indian homeland to Burma. He gives a series of dates. For example, um, he talks about, in respectful terms, about Mahatma Gautam Bud. So this is now a clear term, the great soul Gautama, the historical Buddha, outlines his key teachings, his core teachings, and his dates. But what's the source, he cites? One of the great things for me of moving towards texts written after 1900s is the invention or the adoption into Islamic languages of the footnote, the citation. So who does he cite? Which you know where the information comes from. Gustave Le Bon and his uh, The Civilization of India, which had a very large impact, having been translated into Urdu by uh, one of the Bilgramis, one another North Indian. So this was part then, this reference to Le Bon isn't sort of just like a unique one-off thing. In fact, as I was looking through the South Asian uh, uh, number of Urdu works, of which there are a lot after 1900, and a few a little bit before in the 1890s. There's a whole series then of this indirect rediscovery of Buddha through Orientalists, but also particularly through Theosophists uh, and some other curious characters. So one of the earliest texts uh, in detail I could find is a translation of uh, Rhys Davids, the, uh, who uh, learned Pali, lived in, in Salon, the specialist on Salonese Buddhism. His book translates Dharm Buddha, the religion of Buddha in 1889 into Urdu. By uh, 1892, we have a Hindu author writing Urdu, Ramnath, using kind of some of this work now, locating a historical figure called Buddha in India. By 1902, we have that fascinating German theologian who moves to America, Paul Karras, and writes a famous text, The Gospel of Buddha, the counterpart to the famous Ed Arnold's um, 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 I'm forgetting the name of Edwin Arnold's really famous uh, Christological depiction of Buddha. The Spirit of Asia? No, it's not the Spirit of Asia, nonetheless. But Arnold's book had also been translated not into Urdu, but into Japanese, into Burmese, into Selenese, into other Indian languages. And it's actually through Arnold's Christological depiction of the gentle, meek Buddha that Gandhi described in his own words. That's how I learned about Buddha. So the translation then of these Christological, theological Christian appreciations of Buddha that in Karas's book become literally the name of his book translated to Urdu and other languages, the Gospel of Buddha. And then we have by 1909, I haven't got the an Urdu copy of it, but here's a uh, Bengali version there, 1905 in Bengali, 1909, in Urdu, the translation of German philologist Max F. Max Muller, the translation of his translation from Pali into English of the Dharmapada, what's often then seen as the Gospel of Buddha in this Protestant framing of the Buddhists must have a core scripture as well. That gets translated to Urdu as well. So suddenly we have this burst of the discovery then of not just Buts then, but also more particularly, we can see there, this is the the Buddhas that they have in Japan. This is the, the Buddhas that they have in Tibet and so on. And also the use of the word murat as well is a more respectful term for a statue, not just a, an idol. We have more and more of these texts and it was just shifting from the, the generic idol to the particular figure of the Buddha, of Bud, or sometimes Buddha, um, and a religion and an artistic tradition of his own. And indeed, moving away from the language of idols to the language of art. Tas, we had an image then, not just an, an idol. That comes from a history of the Deccan that's written 
1918, giving a description relying upon archaeological reports and of the Archaeological Survey of India of the famous Buddhist caves of the Deccan. Another interesting case here of the curious American, as much as Eurasian roots then of this rediscovery of Buddha, of a very peculiar figure called Charles Strauss, a Jewish American who went to the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, met, um, met Dharmapala, the great Selenese Buddhist missionary who had been rediscovered his Buddhism through the theosoph founder of the Theosophical Society, the New Yorker, Colonel Alcott. So this Theosophical Society version of Buddhism comes to Chicago. Charles Strauss, our Jewish American, discovers it, converts to Buddhism, writes this book about the Buddha, and that is in turn translated into Urdu and published uh, in 1926 in this uh, book here by Strauss. So this Indian discovery of Buddhism then is coming from some very, or well, this Islamic rediscovery of Buddhism is coming from some very curious roots. But still, as I said, this isn't a one-way street. This isn't a nice teleology where now the Buddha discovered and that's all good. Everybody knows this. The language of the Buddha is still continues throughout this period. In Akbar's time, at Akbar, we've already seen the Aini Akbari, the, the other great account of Buddhism before the 19th century then that I mentioned earlier, but also from Akbar's period, we have this text of a uh, of a, an account to conquer the countryside between Kabul and Lagman then, the countryside which is the land of the Kafirs. And these are the Kafir the infidels, and as we all know, the, the Kafirs who were the, the peoples of the highlands still survive a little bit in northwest Pakistan, uh, the Kailash as they're called, but these are then, as it were, people who seem to worship idols. And the knowledge of them here then, this is in Afghanistan, there's not a, a land of the historic Buddha. There are more Buddhist stupas between Peshawar and Jalalabad, apparently, than anywhere in the world. But Afghanistan isn't seen as a site of a historical Buddha. And indeed, the buts that are discussed there are these buts of these mountain or these forest people. As late as 1893, in this text that uh, Nushin Abavzad and I kind of published in the Journal of the American uh, Oriental Society there. And we have apparently a first person autoethnographic account of one of these kafirs describing his religion or his former religion. He's just converted to Islam. But this too is the language of Buts that's still alive in Afghanistan's first newspaper in the 1870s. We also have statues then, not just text or reports or words but the actual idols themselves are being brought down from the Kafir territory. In 1896, when Abdul Rahman Khan, the rule of Afghanistan, conquers through his self-declared or declared by his ulama, the jihad against the Kafirs, his official historian and the subsequent official historian, the great Afghan historian, Faiz Muhammad Khatib Hazara, describes how these very statues here, photographed in a go-down in Kabul, in a warehouse in Kabul in the 1900s, these are described then in the Suraj Tawarikh, the Lantern of Histories, uh, published in 1912, that Field Marshal Ghulam Haydar Khan, I'm, I'm quoting here from uh, Rob McChesney's translation. Field Marshal Ghulam Haydar Khan sent to Kabul 19 wooden idols, but the term but McChesney informed comes up 24 times in the text. 19 wooden idols from the people of Kafiristan. These were carved in the form of their dead. Some were seated on chairs, others in a standing position and were objects of worship. They were kept as souvenirs of the conquest of Kafiristan. And from this point on, it's fitting to remember that His Majesty Abdul Rahman was given the nickname the Idol Smasher, the Butcher Camp. So the language of idols and butchers is still alive here in the 20th century. And indeed, this uh, text, a Fatname, the Fatname of Kafiristan, published in 1896 then, by Shia Ahmad Jalalabadi, one of the participants. Again, this is full of the language of idols. But the but then is not now a specific Buddha. It's still the generic idol of the forest. None of these buts have names, at least in an Islamic language. Obviously, they did in the languages of Kafiristan. When we do have the Buddhas from Afghanistan, the famous Bamiyan Buddhas, well, these have been described as, as early as the Hudud al-Alam, the very early geographical text. And they've been described then as simply the Sokh but and the Khing but, the red idol and the white idol. And that language had continued 
right until the late 19th century. I came across this uh, image, this lithographic image and an accompanying text about the Butz of Bamiyan in the Tehran magazine, Sharaf. And then this actually comes from Alexander Burns writing in 1832. But Burns at that point, the, the British Orientalists are still debating at this point whether the Buddha and these statues have come from East Africa or from China, maybe from India, but that's not a very favorable theory. So Burns doesn't, he has the word Buddhist in the English version, but there's not really a great deal of historical knowledge. But yet when the text is translated 50 years later into Sharaf, there's still no word for Buddhist being used in at least in Tehrani Persian. So this is still a language of the Buts of Bamiyan, the Sukh But and, and, and the, uh, the White But. By the 1920s and 30s, we have a real major Afghan rediscovery then of Buddhism, particularly by this major Afghan historian, a huge, probably perhaps the most famous Afghan historian, the most influential Afghan historian of the 20th century, Ahmed Ali Khosrow. There we see him as an interpreter. He'd been to the French school in Kabul. Uh, the French Lycée, founded by the French archaeologists, and he's studying there, working as the sorry, working as the interpreter of Jean Carl, the French archaeologist. Writes down with uh, Ria Akan, the the wife of uh, the head of the French Delegation Archaeologique Française en Afghanistan, the DAFA. He, he collects a series of the folklore of Bamiyan, which is fascinating, and then they're translated to the French. So we know what in the 1920s the people who lived around Bamiyan, what they thought of this site, that these the buildings they lived around. And then he starts translating from French and then writing his own accounts for the Afghan reading public of the book past. And what we have here is what we can see here is a really major shift, which we see not only in Afghanistan, but throughout, I think, India and other regions of, of, of Muslim authors and indeed beyond. A shift from the theological problem of the idol to the aesthetic appreciation of the Buddha figure as but as idol, but the aesthetic appreciation of the statue of the Mujassim or the Mujassim rather than the, the but, the statue rather than the idol. And indeed, what we can see here in, the, in a phrase taken from uh, another French scholar, but it's a really key moment, 1949 article here by Kozard is Satnati Yunani Yunanu Buddhai. So it's art now. The, the, the Greco-Buddhist art, that phrase there. So we can now have this aesthetic appreciation. Still, there are problems because in this age of nationalism from the 1920s onwards, there's the claim of whose Buddha is this? This isn't so much of a cosmopolitan rediscovery of Buddha as a national competing on Afghan post stamps, the Indian flag, of a claiming for a Buddha for the national self as much as a recognition of the religious other. Well, I'll dash through now in the 10 minutes I have a bit through China and we'll have a peep at Japan as well, where we have, of course, well, I mean, needless to say, I don't read uh, Chinese and the, the writings of the Han Kitab, but as far as I'm aware, the Han Kitab syllabus is really between Confucianism and Islamic doctrines rather than Chinese Buddhism. So the accounts that I know of the encounters of Buddhism in China, well, there's a various Muslims who start to move to China and Japan through the steam and print technology of the 19th century. Here we have the, the, the route taken by Abdul Rashid Ibrahim, the Siberian Tatar, who writes a fine, famous account of Japan and Korea. But in terms of describers of Buddha, or Buddhism, or the religion of Buddhism, the most fascinating text I found was printed in the 1890s in Bombay and in Calcutta, this Persian litho on the right. And as I read it, and read more of it, I thought, could this possibly be? as indeed it turned out to be, a translation from Latin into Persian of Matteo Ricci's famous account of China. And this includes then Ricci being a Jesuit who was very fond of the Confucians. We have a great account of the Confucians. And then that's translated from Latin into Persian. The actual original text was in the 1660s. I have an article coming out of this in the Journal of the Asiatic Society. So I'll keep it short now. But turning simply to the account of what we would call Buddhism, in Ming China. Well, remember that Ritchie has just turned up in the 1600s, about 1600 in the Ming capital in Beijing. He's come from a Europe that has no word, no idea of Buddhism either. 
he's confronted with this religious spectrum and he's seeing China through the lenses and the words and the guiding and the books of the Confucian literati, who are also very anti-Buddhist. So, but he does describe what we will call Buddhism, but it's not what he nor his Persian translator would call anything resembling. So to translate then the account of Buddhism, well, the second mazhab, the second religion of the people of China is called Shakya and Imnuf. And this religion was brought from the kingdom Tian So, which is now called Hindustan. Great. In the 65th year after the birth of Isa, peace be upon him. So the dates are, I guess, wrong now, I would say empirically. But India is right. But what are these problematic names, Shakya and Imnuf? Well, they, when they translate to Persian, that's not in any dictionary. Anyone reading this, whether in the 1600s or the 1900s, would have no idea to relating this to this religion of Burma or these other figures or these idols, because it's this strange word, because, because Ritchie does not have a word or concept for this religion of Buddhism he's never heard of. He has to Latinize a Chinese term, which is itself the Sinicized version of a Sanskrit term, and that Latinized version has to get part, just transliterated into Persian, which literally means nothing, Shakya. Now we know, it's okay, it's the religion of Shakyamuni, but you've got to know a lot of stuff to work that out. So it's an account of Buddhism. It gets printed again. We do have continuity, great, from the 1600s to the 1900s. And yet, how meaningful would it be? But it's a fascinating text. We have another text, an account of China, an account of the Chinese empire, that gives us some examples and of continuity. It draws an Ibn Battuta, a Rashid ad-Din, a Banakati, the other medieval uh, describer of China, and Confucius. But our author, Munshi Karkaran Sahib, would probably be easily pronounced and recognizable in Canada as James Carl Coran, an Irishman who worked as a translator for the East India Company, who compiled all of these this information from the Orientalist imprints of Batuta that were being made from the 1830s. This was in the 1860s, 1850s, 1860s, pioneering text. By the 1900s, though, we're getting somewhere. But again, it's through these circuitous routes of translation. The other great Buddhist, Chinese Buddhist pilgrim, Xuan Tsang, whose translation of the text into French had enabled the archaeological rediscovery of Buddhist sites in India by the archaeological survey. And then it's translated from the English version based on the French version by Reverend Beale, Re Reverend Beale here into Urdu as the travels of a uh, the, China, the travels of a Chinese traveler, translated from the English. But here we have there now a Chinese Buddhist primary source translated into an Indian language. And now we have sort of a sense of the, not just the historical continuity, but of the connections between India and China through Buddhism. It was Bengali scholars, in fact, who were more involved in this, particularly Abhod Chandra Bhakti, who actually learned Chinese to study the, the movement of, and the, to actually rediscover Sanskrit Buddhist texts that only now survived in Chinese. But Eurasian this may be, but Islamic it is not. Well, I'll spend a couple of minutes then uh, on Japan. We have accounts then of Japan, the other, in a sense, Buddhist country as well, of course, as a Shinto country. Shinto presented all sorts of other problems, as you might imagine, conceptualizing that. But it was done, the religion of the Arva, the religion of the spirit. Ibrahim Sahbashi, a fascinating merchant, about we hear the, the figure of the kind of we hear so much about in world history, the merchants got around everywhere, but they rarely wrote books. This guy did, which is why it's so exciting. He writes an account of being in Yokohama uh, and some other towns as well, Kamakura, it seems, in 1897. He's fascinated by what he sees, but still, he, he describes Japan in entirely Islamic terms. This is a culture where there are mullahs and ahuns and hammams. There are also great big idols. There's a great big iron idol that is so big people crawl through it and come out through its nostrils. But this is still the language of the but, even though this is the but as spectacle. Perhaps the aesthetic medieval Persianers rather than the theological negative but, but a but, but a but, it still is. Bit of a tongue twister there. But again, things change relatively quickly. That short spade between 1893 and by 1904, we have another Iranian figure, Mehdi Quli Hidayat a future statesman, future prime minister. He'd studied in Germany. He knew German. He was a very broad-minded and a great literary scholar as well. 
great sympathy here for, for the teachings of the Buddha. We have now the word nirvana transliterated into Persian and described as being alike to what Rumi was describing. And a quote from Rumi put side by side. So we have this great sympathy. We have Chinese, sorry, Japanese terms as well transliterated. But it's very clear, as he makes plain on this page as I've shown here, that he's quoting and drawing upon German and English sources. The person he's quoting there at the bottom, wonder of Google Books, I to find this so easily, is was from someone called Elizabeth Good, Gooden, who was a British student of F. Matt Muller who also brought Sanskrit to the, to the modern Japanese scholarship, enabled the modern Japanese rediscovery of historical Buddhism and taught the great Japanese scholar Takakusu. So we have then this sort of, again, this very circuitous then rediscovery then of Buddhism in Japan and taken to Iran. Well, we have a great many kind of texts then celebrating Japan after the Russo-Japanese war, the year uh, that, uh, that the previous text was, uh, was being finished, well, was being started, but these make little of the religions of, of Japan, precisely because this whole Japanophilia that sweeps across the Islamic world has to present Japan as a role model for modernization, but has to do so in a way that overcomes the, the problem of, well, what religion are these people? What is this? So there's very little discussion. And indeed, there are a whole series of attempts to, and rumors that the Mikado, as it becomes called in Persian, is about to. Again, it's art to the rescue here. So we have a, another fascinating interlingual figure here, Fazli, uh, Badruddin Fazli, who uh, teaches Urdu and Japanese in, at the Tokyo School of Foreign Language, the Tokyo the Japanese Imperial Language School. So he's teaching these languages and he makes, uh, he writes a long account, a two volume a diary of time in Japan, as well as a history of Japan. And his description then of Buddhism is again through the language of art. And now the term art itself, art, becoming a loan word into Urdu that, that overcomes the old problem of idolatry and theology to describe then and celebrate the great Buddhist architecture and statues of Nara uh, in Japan as, uh, as being art now rather than idolatry. Well, I'll finish off then with a text that I will confess that I haven't got hold of yet, but I've read the French original, the one in the middle at least, of just noticing at least in a nod to uh, our organizer here and the other side of Eurasia, that Islamic Eurasia I haven't touched on. Turkish, modern Turkish discovery of Buddhism. And here we have a really fascinating set of intellectual interlocutors, a series of German, particular German indologists, series of German and Jewish German scholars fled and were taken in, sought refuge and were given refuge by Ataturk at Ankara University in the 1920s and 30s. And the fruit of that were these new intellectual uh, cross-pollinations. Walter Rubin then wrote histories of, uh, of uh, India. Some were translated, some he lived in Turkey long enough to write in Turkish. He wrote uh, accounts of uh, Buddhist uh, religious institutions then, that article there from 1942 describing the great Buddhist university of Nalanda, for example. And then we have a translation, the first book I could find at least in Turkish, the first complete book on the Buddha. And again, a curious author, Edward Shur, or Edouard Shure, uh, who'd written this text in 1885, it was published in 1930 in its Turkish version. And here too was another theosopher who was drawn to his writing about Buddhism through his interest in, in theosophy, which was the great promoter of a Buddhist revival, even among Buddhists themselves. Well, finally then, where does this leave us by the 20th century between aesthetic and theology, between condemning the uh, worship of, 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 of idols and uh, the uh, aesthetic rediscovery? Was there anything in between the two? Well, indeed there was. By the early 20th century, the Syrian uh, religious Muslim reformist then, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, wrote a tafsir that discussed this surah of the Quran, a teen, the fig or the fig tree, which had long apparently puzzled exegetes. I swear by the fig or the fig tree and the olive tree in Mount Sinai and this city made secure. And the 
the um, the commentators the uh, on the Quran, the tafsir writers, for centuries said, well, yeah, we know what the olive tree is. That represents Jerusalem. That's Jesus. Mount Sinai, of course, that's Moses. This city made secure. That's Medina. This is the Prophet Muhammad. What what's what's this team? What's this fig tree? But by the early 20th century, we're getting Arabic accounts of the Buddha, not least in Beirut through Beirut American uh, uh, Lebanese translating for um, for Al Bustani's Arabic uh, encyclopedia. Then perhaps that's the root Qasimi discovers. Oh, there's this figure called Buddha and the figus religiosa, the fig tree under which the Buddha came. So then we have then an overcoming then of fitting the Buddha into the words of the Quran itself. And yet, like I said, it wasn't a straight and easy teleology from there on. By the later, through the 20th century, we have the uh, Pakistani popular historical no, uh, uh, novelist, Hussein Sadiqi, then writing novels such as his Butchi Khan, celebrating Mahmud of Hasna, uh, albeit raiding, of course, the Temple of Somnat more than any Buddhist temple, but again, that conflation of, of idols with Buddhas altogether. And then by the uh, very beginning of the 21st century, then the uh, Saudi Salafi Nasir al-Fad then, who wrote this book, the Iqamat al-Burhan, al-Othan, then the established proof of the obligation to smash idols, defending the theological correctitude of the Taliban in destroying Buddhas of Bamiyan. Well, I was hoping to, oh yeah, I can. Yet we still have nonetheless, by the later 20th century, the early 21st century, the language of Buddhism, the celebration of Buddhism has come about, not least in this wonderful song by Musa Namju, a very well-known Iranian singer. And he's singing here, you'll recognize the words, many of you, I'm sure. Harudi Darya, Harbudi Buddha Shodibud. Every river goes to the ocean. Every being, every Buddha, using the language here of then of the Masnavi, every being then became a Buddha. on top of that. So despite my final slide, I think I will end there. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> Can I take a rest now, Naveen? Are you taking over? Are you doing something? Hello. Um, I should have introduced you. It's okay. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Right. I, I'll introduce you. Don't worry. Really? Yeah, okay. everyone knows who I am. Yeah, well, that's what I think. I guess people <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Navina, and um, I'm at UBC in the Asian Studies Department. Um, and I am delighted to be doing this, serving as discussant for this wonderful talk. Um, thanks so much, friends, for inviting me to do it. Um, like many of you in this room who know Niall or know his work, uh, when I heard that he wrote this book, I was filled with a familiar combination of deep admiration and a little bit of envy <laughs> and Niles' um, relentless uh, scholarly pursuits that never end. Um, and so I, yeah, I was, I, I was just like, of course, he's written about how Isha found herself. Um, but, um, you know, levity aside, um, one thing I noticed as I read this book and I and I listened to Niall today um, is his modus operandi, how he has these pools of inquiry that he's sort of kept alive over 
his career and he's sort of drawn on all of them in this particular book. Uh, you see sort of shadows of Bombay Islam, um, the Persian at world, frontiers of Eurasian where Franca, uh, his work on Afghan history, and and he's you know brought a lot of stuff from there and added more stuff, made it extremely erudite and taken it to more uh, imaginative heights. Um, and so as I engage with uh, his talk today, um, I don't think I can actually engage with much of the content simply because of the sheer breadth and um, range of the kinds of materials that he's brought into conversation with each other. So my comments are going to be fairly abstract about methodology. And um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll organize them as um, very brief. Um, the first will be uh, some thoughts about the mechanics and functional aspects of the claims that you're making now. And the second will have to do with the geography of the region that you're looking at, um, or the, the sites that you're putting in connection with one another. Uh, and then the third will be uh, sort of the sociology of this world that you're exploring. So um, regarding the mechanics and the functionality of um, the story that you're telling um, or the functional aspects of the story that you're telling, uh, one thing you know struck me immediately is uh, the prominence of lithography. And I know this is uh, uh, the history of lithography is something that you're deeply interested in and you've published a lot about it. Um, what I was thinking about and working with your argument about disjunctures and disconnections um, is, you know, what if we're moving from a world of manuscripts where you could have, um, you know, paratextual elements and, you know, leave signs and traces of how people engage with these materials, you know, the kind of stuff that Nir as well is interested in. Um, you don't do the same thing with lithographs. So I was wondering if I could ask you to kind of flip your argument a little bit, or at least think through this with me uh, and indulge me a little bit, which is what does lithography not make possible? Um, and so, because I was thinking that it's so fragile, the paper is so fragile, right? Just the, if you think about it, how are you supposed to store a lithograph? You know, it's going to tear, it's going to, it's flimsy. It's not as durable as a manuscript, right? It's not a luxury product. And so what is then lost? What, what we do know is the sheer volume that lithography makes possible, that it's cheap, that it's accessible, that there are these various locations uh, that you trace through the book and that you've sort of alluded to in this talk. Um, and a few things struck is one, especially today when you were speaking, is the, the illustrations, um, which are so different from manuscript illustrations, right? They're almost diagrammatic, almost like you're trying to telegraph an image as it really exists. This is this is a statue of the Buddha. These are the ba Bamiyam Buddhas. This is the foot. Um, and so it's almost like designed to engage with the type of reader that may not be able to actually read a lithographic text. And so that's one sort of thought or suggestion you're not just thinking of art as um, a cipher for religion, as you've discussed it today, but also art as just a way of uh, communicating within the lithographic text um, in a way that wasn't possible with, with manuscripts. Um, yeah, and also, you know, uh, when, when you think about polemical works or missionary works or uh, uh, some of these materials that are heresiographies, for example, that you that you talk about, um, are they meant to be read and debated by somebody in a larger sort of setting? Do you get a sense from these works that you're that you're reading that you have uh, a larger audience beyond the person that's holding the lithographic text? So I think I want to sort of push you um, to think a little bit about uh, what what's possible and not possible with the lithographic text that you're uh, looking at. And the same with sort of, you know, newsprint, um, uh, magazines and the other stuff that you're looking at in this book. Uh, and I know you have quite a bit in the book itself about educational institutions and some stuff about libraries. Um, but yeah, if you could, you know, think with me um, regarding that aspect, the lithography. And the second thing I wanted to raise um, was the was the geography of this world that you're constructing um of, of 
sort of Asia finding herself through these various uh, and not finding herself through these various mechanisms. Um, so port cities, of course, play a very important part in the story that you're telling. Um, but there's also people. There are these disjunctures that you that you kind of allude to. Um, and I'm just wondering if if we think about where those stories might go. Um, so for example, if if I could just clarify what I'm saying a little bit, the theosophists that you spoke about, there's this story that you're tracing about how this Christological stuff, you know, feeds into something else, it feeds into something else that feeds into this Islamic understanding of the Buddha, right? But what if we sort of looked at something that's happening at the same time, which is in South India, you have Pandit Ayoti Das, who is also engaging with the theosophists. And then he brings this Buddhist idea into a very sort of a much narrower space, which is that of Dalit activism in South India. Um, and so it goes into this regional space rather than becoming something that that travels. So yeah, so I'm just thinking about about sort of a more so one of the things that Niall does in his book, which he didn't really talk about quite a bit in this in this talk, is he thinks of of self and other as ways of engagement, dialectical engagement. And so I'm thinking what happens when you see yourself in a larger space and then use that to, to, to kind of bolster or strengthen a regional conception, uh, which could be happening with this Buddhist stuff in South India, which is, is, is happening at the same time that you're having this sort of larger Islamic discussion about the Buddha. Um, was that clear? Did, yes, okay. And then finally, um, I wanted to ask you about the self-awareness of the people who are part of this um, this this transfer of information, um, because you know there's a for, for for scholars who aren't really looking at the kind of geographical scope that you are. Uh, there's a long history, for example, in British India to sort of see things in a linear progression and just say, well, there's colonialism. And so you have this sort of Weberian move from the Ashraf to a middle class and that kind of direction, right? And you're looking at, you know, educators, diplomats, missionaries, uh, and some merchants. Um, this is also the time where there are lots of soldiers who are also people that you're interested in, who are sort of traveling around British India. Uh, there's a lot of indentured labor, more in the Caribbean, but also in Fiji, Malaya, Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm just wondering if these people see themselves as set apart from that world, if there's a certain self-awareness of us as, as operating in this rarefied transfer of knowledge, or if it is actually something that is. So that's, I'm going to stop there because I know there are lots of people here who have questions for you, but those are just some thoughts that occurred to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabina. That was really a uh, wonderful epilogue. One gets used to being introduced, but being, I don't know what the opposite of that is. So debriefed, yeah, <laughs> figuratively. Um, yeah, that was really yeah, fascinating. And now I'm, I'm trying to thinking hard. Okay, so first of all, lithography. I mean, I think on the one hand, what, what lithography can still do is you do have these lithographs that you'll have seen that have the, the harsh air, isn't it? The sort of the comments along the margin, which are printed, you know, as well, the printing of that. So lithography is really, really very flexible and, and pointing to the images as you did as well. And I think perhaps I didn't do enough thinking about, you know, the, the illustrations in, in the book that these are perhaps reach another audience that, who are non-literate. Even though one of the things that, you know, lithography is coinciding with the point of vernacularization, and so many of these books are, uh, you know, quite sort of, de sort of the Desi vernacular kind of language. Um, but the illustrations, I think you make a really important point that they're perhaps, oh, look at this, you can't read, but look at this. Um, and I think what's really important that least lithography is doing there, and that's not what you asked, is when I go back to that, that Jami Tawadik, that unique image of Shakmuni and the devil, 
and that, at least as, as Sheila can be, the art historian is concerned, that's come out of Rashida Dean's. I'm not sure how this would stand in the light of Stefan Kamola's recent work that the whole book isn't by Rashida Dean, but still. But it's come out of his royal atelier, atelier, you know, kind of in Tabriz. So it's at that level. There's one copy, and that's where it's come from, from the, the Ilkhan's atelier or the Ilkhan Vizier's atelier. But the, with these lithos, there's so many copies, all sorts of people can look at them. And to me, that's really an extraordinary thing that I think, you know, I should have played up in the book and now I have to write something else. Look what you've done um, about these lithos and what they're doing, and particularly of these different types of the Buddhas from elsewhere. You don't have to travel to Japan or Tibet now. You can see all the different ones. What are the limitations, though? I'm just kind of circling around your question rather than answering it. What are the limitations? Well, <laughs> I mean, I suppose it, you know, may not. I, I can't actually directly think of a of a limitation immediately. Let's say in the form itself, but perhaps in the way, let's say that they circulate. That now, you know, books. These are books that are, some of them are sold for profit or they're you know self published. But you know, most of these books have their price on them. It's one of the things of the, the long standing problem is reception that we all deal with. This is great because a lot of them have the price and the print run. So at least that's something, you know. But that means they're now being sold now going from the marketplace. They're not books being encountered, let's say, in the madrasa or the, the halka teaching circle where you're getting the, the commentary from the teacher and you're getting that as part of it. That now it's freestyle, you work it out alone or you don't. You don't know what shakya means? Too bad. You know, no one's going to tell you that, oh, when Richie said that. So I think maybe that's something that, the, that then they will enter a marketplace for the, individual, the reader on their own. Or reading out to other people, but not the reader with the with the, with the teacher. So maybe there's something with that. Give me a prompt for the second question. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Well, I think there. I mean, it, even though I keep writing these, some of these broad, you know, big-reaching books, I'm really kind of a, a local microhistorian by instinct and by preference. I think that's kind of what all history is, and Big history, global history, is local history at aggregates or something. So behind each of these things, there's so many local things going on, etc. But perhaps to explain to the people who, who haven't read the book, what I was at least the, the bigger that you hinted at, the sort of the, the link I was trying to make between all these things that are going lo on locally in these bigger stories, this process that I call what did I call it the 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 dialectic between the Projection of the self and the appreciation of the other. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's like, okay, we found like the, the stamp I showed or the Indian flag. The, there's this discovery of the Buddha, which is an appreciation of otherness, but then it becomes a mode of, of the projection of that because, oh, no, no, the Buddha's Indian. Oh, no, no, it, it's Afghan. It's part of the national flag. And then one gets all of these Indian Pan Asianists for whom outreach into China. And Japan, these are part of an India-centered, Indo-centric, greater India, the greater India society that does that, as you have read about. So I think in that way, there is something that perhaps is a more, I, that's what the closest I've got to a general process, that there is, in this example of then Dalit self-empowerment, that's like, okay, the Dalit, you know, and the, the uh, and uh, um, this sort of an encounter of a rediscovery of learning the Buddha. And of course, the text of the Buddha being translated into what can be read in Maharashtra, not least with the Dalit movement. But then, of course, that becomes a, a self-empowerment. Like about this discovery of Japan, you appreciate the Japanese other, but it's for lessons of Turkish and Iranian self-empowerment. If insofar as I can find something that grapples with the two, but nonetheless, my conviction is that, yeah, history is happening locally. So, yeah, the third one, third prompt. Uh, prompt. Yeah. Well, I think I don't think there's a huge amount of a, awareness of one another's books. I mean, whenever I found, you know, texts with footnotes or, or bibliographies, as some of them had, I'd really see if any of the books are cited. Um, <clears throat> should it? The first one on Burma, the one I mentioned, the problematic one, that was cited by the guy who went 30 years later even though ultimately he relied on Gustave Le Bon for his information on Buddha. So one gets a sort of a sense of awareness of other people who are doing this. But that comes to one of the things I, I talked about in the book, as, as you all know, about the, 
there isn't the institutionalization until relatively late of the Calcutta University, the attempt to, no, the attempt to find, for example, the Chini Bhavan, a sort of a Chinese study center at Shantaniketan University in Bengal. So there isn't the institutionalization of this knowledge. It's not like you can go to, okay, here's the, the institute with the library, with bookshelf, BS, whatever else, section Buddha, it will do, all the books are there. You know, we, we, we don't have that. And I think that's why, you know, the, that's why so much of this is piecemeal, I think, across the centuries. There's not the institutionalization of this knowledge. That happens with the Jesuits and the Jesuit college and their collections, for example. Um, so Richard doesn't know anything, but 50 years later, there's a whole lot more that is known, et cetera. So that's institutionalized with libraries, with a, you know, an organization that does that and so on. And I think this kind of Buddhological knowledge or whatever it is, isn't institutionalized in the same way. So people, I think, don't have the awareness of others doing, doing it. To what extent they have awareness of themselves doing it as, as Asia, even though I call the book How Asia Found Herself, a play on words of a famous speech by, by Nehru in 1947. Um, it's actually, as I start out the book by discussing the famous Asianists, the Pan-Asianists, is none of the Pan-Asianists the ones who would think, oh, they should be at the center of a story like this. They're not doing any of the groundwork. So the people who are interested in discovering other Asian cultures aren't actually the ideological, the activist Pan-Asianists. So, so that's why it goes back to, well, actually, you know, we have the canonical, canonical Pan-Asians like Okokoro or something. He doesn't do any of this. He just writes in English and lectures to ladies who lunch in Boston, you know, kind of where he becomes a museum curator. Um, but the guys who are doing this gritty groundwork of going up river and up the Irrawaddy and learning Burmese when there's no book to learn Burmese from, they're not ideologically concerned. They're not interested in the politics of Pan-Asianism. So there's not that going on there, that sort of awareness of being even part of Asia. The term Asia, which I explore in the book, that the how the European word Asia goes into Asian languages and what people in Asia use that word, that concept of Asia to do. Actually, the people who are doing the nitty groundwork of discovering Asia aren't actually thinking of themselves as, oh, uh, we're all Asian, that's why I'm doing this, you know, for the most part. So yeah, circuitous answer again via Siberia or something. I'll try to be quick if I have any more questions. Yeah, I saw you first, yeah, go for it. Uh, we should also check if the people online have any questions too. Okay. Um, thank you now. Wonderful talk as always. Uh, I haven't read the book yet, but now I will definitely pick it up. Uh, so I was just wondering, I completely agree with your, you know, your framing the fact that there, I agree there's no necessity to presume intellectual continuity uh, and so forth. And, and the word you kept using again and again in, in the course of the talk is rediscovery. And I was just wondering if you had thought about or uh, could riff upon the, the idea instead of, of Renaissance, which is, a, is basically a, a similar narrative, right? It's a narrative that's central to European history. Uh, of also of, of intellectual discontinuity of people rediscovering themselves. Uh, and again, often uh, not from um, their own sources, but from uh, borrowing from the you know Arabic translations of uh, ancient Greek or Latin or uh, Syriac works. Uh, and I was just wondering if you ever thought about, let's say this is a different model uh, or uh, set. Discovery is different from Renaissance. Yeah, yeah I, I just thought I was wondering if you, you know, if this parallel ever crossed your mind, or if it's. Uh, I guess my I was just yeah. pointing out that this yeah. is constant. You know, we still have, as much as we're obsessed with connectivity, and and, and cosmopolitanism and con continuity today, and trying to show that that there has always been these kind of narratives of intellectual disassociation and rediscovery, kind of central to. Uh, European history or to uh, yeah, right. human history. And not consciously, I hadn't thought about Renaissance as a sort of a, as a parallel, though perhaps it crept in years ago. My first ever academic job was working for Sir Jack Goody when he was writing his book Renaissances, I think it was. So who knows? But it, it might be in there. But but yeah, and, and where I've even, you know, unconsciously 
when you said that word you kept using, I was like, oh, this is this is like therapy or something. What <laughs> I keep using? I'm not aware of. So it's it's rediscovery. So and I wonder where I got that from. Was it, you know, kind of was it Nehru, you know, kind of the discovery of India? Is it there? There's so many other books. There's quite an interesting book, the what's it called? The the British discovery, no, the European discovery of Buddha or something like that. So there's there's so many discovery books. And Ahmed Shamsi's recently. What I usually do when I'm com confronted with this is I go to the etymology. And I don't know if, from the top of my head what the etymology discovers. Is it uncover? I mean, maybe. I don't know. Is it something to do with that? Because there is that. I mean, there's the digging up of, 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 the, the, his, of the Buddhist monuments, which actually creates the... Because across Asia itself, you know, it is, a, it is for Buddhists themselves, you know, kind of not just, you know, for the Muslims or whoever else or Dalit. Hindus, if such they are, um, it's not just them who are this, this discovery of Buddha, rediscovery of Buddha, because the historical Buddha hasn't been known. It's sort of it's created anew. This isn't, you know, the theological Buddha of a practicing Buddhists of many bodies it isn't a historical Buddha in a particular time and place, you know, kind of particular, at least not a concrete, specific place that people can can visit. So yeah, I, I suppose the conceptual thing, maybe I think there's I'm, I'm rooting, I'm digging for, you know, like a, a metaphor, but something in there actually that's linked to something tangible. There's actually a historical moment when these things are, you know, they are dug up and uncovered. Um, but still, insofar as I'm over and over using the word rediscovery, that does make me question because I'm not sure even if they are. That's why I put in brackets. I'm, I'm probably, if I had to put my money on one, one thing that's going on, I would say, there, there are lots of separate and individual processes of forgetting and having to discover again. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's the sort of an answer in some ways. Right, and that's, I guess, what I'm mean, not a scholar of the Renaissance, but I mean, I think that's also the where the scholarship on, from European history has moved towards, right? Is that there's no one, you know, moment in Italy where people rediscover the ancient Latin past, and then, yeah. but there's multiple places throughout you continental Europe where they start digging up coins and yeah. going back to old texts. And Still, I mean, insofar as a comparison with Europe, one thing I do talk about in the, in the book, and and, uh, and I'll try not to talk about at length now, but it's a comparison I make between how is it that, let's say, Orientalism, I use the word neutrally, you know, including the, the Jesuits or whatever, manages to, to create such a sustainable, you know, kind of once things are sort of known from 1400, whether we call it whatever we're going to call it, 1500 or Richie onwards, it, there's a, people can build and on it becomes a cumulative acquisition of, of furthering of knowledge. We're not kind of seeing that the same way. And one of the things I think is because of the Europe compared to Asia is there's a, a such a there's a basically a couple of scripts in play, yeah, three four scripts in play, something like that. Uh, and along the language of scholarship, there's a few centres. There's you know kind of London, Paris, St Petersburg are the key centres. Rome also. People are corresponding. They're much closer. People can move between. So I, I think in a way, comparisons with Europe are sort of useful insofar as actually when we think about what a similar discovery or set of discoveries would mean, it's way more difficult in age. All of the different languages, the language groups, you know the the geographical distance and the sheer barriers of Himalayas and Pamirs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then not the institutions that are sort of continue to do this thing. And what we do have as Sufi networks, they're not interested in, you know, it seems as far as we know, I'd love Devon. I really would love Devon to, to show. Oh no, but the Central Asian Naxx band has had these whole manuals of Buddhology. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'd, I'd love, I really would love to hear that. So uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, but um but you know what institutions there are, let's say that a Jesuit like aren't involved in this kind of endeavor. I don't think. Mm. Are they? Can I ask a follow up? Anyone else? And, and first of all, thanks for for this. I really enjoyed the talk. Really looking forward to reading the book. Um, I'm wondering in these different sort of modes of knowledge production that you touched on heresiography and then the more kind of the later cosmopolitan travelers. Um, if in the mix there are also demographers or other people producing knowledge um, sort of in the interest of the state. And I'm thinking about, if I remember right, in, in Jahangir's memoirs, he, he encounters what we could probably infer are Buddhists. And he, like you say, has, has no language to make sense of them. But I'm wondering if there are other people 
um, producing knowledge about Buddhists or Buddhism um, in that vein? Well, certainly, let's say in the you know the, the pre-print era, let me call it that. You know, the manuscript era. I mean, I mean, certainly, it's when one looks at the the Arab or the Persian geographical writers, etc. That's where one, if one looks up you know, Buddhism or Buddha or whatever, the Encyclopedia of Islam, the Encyclopedia of Iranica, you're going to get all the summaries of Ibn al-Muqaf and blah, 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 and, and all of these figures. But you're absolutely right that there are these occasional disruptions of, of, of the Nobahar. There's this Nobahar and et cetera. But, but this is, in a sense, the, the scholarly problem that I think is the issue here, is that now any of these articles that you read or, or did various works that have been written on, you know, kind of Islam and Buddhism on the Silk Road and various these things, sort of say, okay, well, the sort of the, the, the problematic methodological assumption that we can recognize that, oh, now Bahad, sure, okay, that's from the Sanskrit word that, you know, that clearly is a new Vihara, and now Vihara, that's a new monastery, etc. So that is it. So there's a, there's a, here we are, there we go, an Arabic and Muslim account of Buddhism or a connection with it. And, and to me, that's a problematic assumption because, well, you, but you've got to show, first of all, there's a, an Arabic account of a Buddha first. So no, there's a, an understanding that of a Buddhism and the and now Bahad is et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there are all, all of those things, the geographical work, the travel of works, the books, books of roads and cities, you know, kind of these, these this genre, you know, plenty, albeit, you know, perhaps in some ways crumbling as well. And it's the same with the Zoroastrian sites, isn't it? Of Alistahri and so on, and you know, accounts of the 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 artist cutters and in you know outside Yazd and so on, I was mentioning earlier. But but yeah, but I think that's you know, that's the kind of problem that can we assume that, oh, well, that means there's knowledge of Buddhism. No, there's a, a knowledge of a, a ruin called Nobahad. No, that, that's not the same thing. Of course, there are individual authors who might have had relatively more or less understanding, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, so I don't know if that sort of that helps. Yeah, yeah, very much. I'm I'm just wondering, that's, I, I, I clearly take the point in these earlier periods. I'm wondering a lot of you know, your material here is 19th century. Um, where you're starting to, as you described, have a language, whether it's you know new and discon uh, discontinuous with the with the earlier, but demography does not come into to play in in the um, in that mission. You, you mean demography of let's say here's a whole group of people and they they are Buddhist. You mean, right here we we need to understand this religious tradition not to make sense of it theologically. And not for the purposes that you know you're describing somebody like um, Hedayat of like can be inspiration for Iranian nationalists or, or something, um, but to understand who we're ruling. What? Well, yeah, I'm not. I mean, certainly from obviously the, the the colonial British side and so on. There's a huge amount of that, and that's what's partly is being you know translated. This Rhys Davids, who is colonial administrator in Ceylon, and then who you know learned to become the you know a scholar of, of, of Pali. Um, and there, there there's certainly a lot of. Uh, Ge geography is one of the kind of genres I look at quite a lot of the books is geography textbooks from India that then get translated into Indian language and so on. Are they doing include? Yeah, here's the section is China. This is, you know, what they, the people of China of whatever religion and so on. But they are, again, largely coming from, and some of those, I mean, actually one of the curious ones is this, uh, a well-known text in, in Iran, the Kitabi Jami Jam of Farhad Mirza which is sort of a well-known Iranian sort of 1850s, I think, sort of lithographic printed, very influential world geography. But the problem is that that's been written by this bibliomaniac, I can talk, you know, kind of English schoolmaster called Pinnock, who, who writes on like all kinds of strange fish and just writes on anything, you know, that anything he might sell to some schools. And that's the book that somehow has happened to turn up in Tabriz that this prince has translated. 70 years later in Iran, we still know that's being used by in, in Afghanistan by the, the government as a book of world geography. But this Pinnock is, is so massively outdated, even the 1820s when he's writing, let alone in the 1920s when he's still being read. So, yeah, there are these, geo, geo, you know, these, let's say, empirical works. But, you know, these are you know, not necessarily reliable either. And when these books turn up in distant places and get translated, there's not necessarily a, you know, particularly a, the point of first translations with Fahad Mirza and the sort of Kaja reform project. This is for the Darul Fanun, it's translated, the first polytechnic in, in Iran, the first university. So at these sort of first moments, there's, it's a, it, there's a bit of sort of randomness, which, you know, I'm, I'm the opposite of a Marxist historian. You know, I think there's all sorts of random things that go on that, uh, in, you know, rather than just, okay. So there are those things too. With demography, I mean, one of the most striking texts I read is uh, an, an, a, a, a 
uh, a Persian text print in Lahore in, I think, 19, it was 1906. And it was a, a print of the Afghan government as a school book. And this was a geography work. And it said there are four religions in the world. There is Islam, and these are the numbers, the population numbers. Because there's a real interest. There's a certain point in the early 20th century when it's thought that the Buddhist, the, the Western demographers think that Buddhism is the biggest religion in the world. And this is a big boost for sort of Buddhist studies and so on. Anyway, so there are the, the numbers there. This is demography. So you know, the one thing I can really think of is onto your question, Afghan school book. Uh, the four religions of the world. The first, the, the Muslims, here are the numbers. Then the Christians, here are the numbers. Here are the Jews, here are the numbers. And then there are the Budparasts, the idol worshippers. That's everybody else. And obviously there's a lot of, lot of those because it's, it's, it's a big category, you know. So yeah, so there is demography, but, but there too, this is... Uh, you know, but then, yeah, 15 years later, then we have, or 20 years later, you know, we have this, the Buddhism Bible and the Afghan nation on, on the stamp. But that stamp is itself withdrawn because of reject of of, uh, of uh, objections of the ulama. So that that Buddhist stamp I showed you had to be withdrawn. So you know, there's throughout these stories, there's a lot of push and pull. It's not all cosmopolitan. The people who oh, this is fantastic. We, we Afghans and we have this Buddhist heritage. And others say, no, 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 no. No, we don't. No, thank you. Um, the large majority of Budparast in that particular textbook draws on a Christ on an oh, oh no, that one I don't know what the origin of that oh. is. Yeah, that that wasn't the 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 pinnock, the Jama Jahan. I don't know. That was a different one. So I don't know what the origin of this was. But insofar as it's printed in Lahore, it's coming from you know there's so much of, of translations of Urdu texts or whatever. Who knows? It might be. A pinnock like character who 70 years ago has said like that. A Christian conception of widespread paganism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Idolaters, yeah. Um, so the question is by Jason or Jason. Sorry if I'm pronouncing wrong. Uh, thank you for your richly illustrated talk with really thought-provoking anecdotes. I would like to ask about the beyond Said aspect of your presentation. Uh, you highlight connections rather than the confrontations of the Saidin model, uh, but do you see your framework of transregional epistemological movement contradicting Said outright? Um, gosh, I could I could probably do with an. Uh, it's a big question, yeah. It's a rich question. It's an uh, intelligent question. I think I'd need a, a quite long time to answer, and I really don't want to do that. Um, I think I think Edward Said is it's just just empirically wrong on on so many things. One of the things I think is empirically wrong with is his, is his phrase that uh, Orientalism is is a product of the of, of the secular Enlightenment. But when one looks at so many of the core beginnings of, of, of so many kind of curentless figures, they're actually really rooted in the learning of Arabic alongside as a Semitic language, alongside Hebrew to better understand the Bible, the chairs of Orientalism, of, the, of Arabic, and then subsequently of Persian at the European universities are rooted in this. So much of the work of 19th century Orientalism is actually deeply concerned with religious and Christian and therefore comparative religious things. So that's one of the elements, I think, that just... That the, the the overall conception in, inside is is I think sort of you know kind of intellectually misconceived as well as various factual errors. The, the other element is as well that I think the 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 Grams the Marxist I Gramsci and I Foucauldian sort of dimension of Said kind of just is it, it, it it's it, it it's so to the script of Gramsci in a sense and via Foucault. That there isn't room in it to me that it, it, it is, is intellectually satisfying to explain all the different things that happen rather than, of course, this text is about power as knowledge as power domination again and again and again. But to me, it's not intellectually satisfying the side and approach. So when Ahmed Shamsi wrote this really wonderful book that I'd like to plug again at the University of Chicago, um, he's just showing something by actually looking at specific text in Arabic and about the letters of Arabic publishers of medieval Arabic texts and saying, well, 
what was actually influencing these Arabic intellectuals in 1880, 1900? Oh, they're writing to Ernst Renan. Oh, they're writing to get a copy of a book to, from Professor Falan at the Sorbonne. Oh, they're disagreeing with them, or they're writing to correct, oh, you're misreading and we need to, our Cairo version is going to be better. This is much more complicated than, than you know, a Saidian, uh, a Saidian uh, reading, I think, of, of Orientalism there. And a whole series of scholars that say Omar Riyadh has been doing this work as well from, from Belgium, himself an Egyptian. So, yeah, that work that these people are doing for me is much more intellectually satisfying than, 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 than Said or indeed Saidian scholarship. Thank you. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. I'm really excited to read the book uh, soon, hopefully. Um, also, I realized during the talk that I inherited my love of microhistory from Taryn, but it's actually from you. <laughs> and <laughs> well, that's great to know. Oh, yeah, um, I've got it from, you know. <laughs> um, I really appreciate thinking about like, you know, barriers and, and discontinuity and, and how both space, time and language uh, provide us with barriers. And because of that, I wanted to ask you to, to say more about than societies where Buddhists and Muslims live together. So Nepal, Tibet, but also China again. Um, even with the Han Kitab, I mean, the, from what I know about the Han Kitab in the 17th century, that is the, the people who started the movement, they knew Buddhist literature really well, even though they allied with the, the Confucians. But I have no idea actually if it continued, because what I've seen from like 19th century stuff in Arabic, it <laughs> doesn't care about Buddhism. Uh, from that same movement. So what's going on sort of not just China, but but like Singapore, for instance, or or Tibet and Nepal? I mean, you mentioned the Himalayas as a barrier, but but what goes on there? Because there is a shared script. There is a shared. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, what people, let's say, kind of, you know, coexistence, people living side by side and rubbing along and knowing more or less about the religion of their neighbors, um, you know, in a sense, that's not what I'm dealing with here for two reasons. One, because I'm actually interested in, in not people knowing about their neighbors, not in, let's say, you know, the, the famous stuff of, of the Muslim Hindu cosmopolitanism of Dada Shikoh and stuff, of people coexisting for centuries, learning one another's languages. That to me is a different thing that, you know, not those, again, the coexistence that people might learn more or less. And occasionally you'll get a Dada Shikoh who's rich enough to pay some people to translate, you know, the Upanishads into Persian. Um, and, and also, I'm, 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 not, I'm, sorry, I'm not interested in that, but I can't work with that in a sense because I don't have a historical record. I can only work with, A, things that people wrote down and B, things that I can either read or someone's, you know, written an article about them or something like that. And as far as I'm aware, you know, I mean, another place, for example, is the, the Malay Muslims of, of Southern Thailand, you know, and uh, there's been some, you know, kind of very interesting work done on them in the last few years about their writings, largely in, in Arabic as well as Malay. But they seem to be writing their own history, you know, and that seems to be much more, you know, kind of commonplace in a sense as well. So the, um, I mean, actually, you know, there's one article, one sort of book that, that there's an Urdu account of Tibet by, I think, by a Kashmiri Muslim that the Mark Gabodio, the French scholar, published the facsimile edition. And that to me, I thought, okay, but this, you know, something like your question in mind, you know, I've got, I can bring Tibet into this living side by side, the Kashmiri Muslims of Tibet. And in Tibet, as in, as in Nepal, the, the Muslims are simply called, I think, Khanche, I think is the word in Tibet, which simply just means Kashmiris. That's what they're conceived of. Um, but here, what was really interesting to me about that, when I came to the bit, okay, now he's described, okay, he's describing the people. What's the word he uses in, in Urdu? Buddhist. English word transliterated. So that's kind of, you know, so I, I didn't quite know what to make of that, but still, you know, even up there. But still, but I think you know that that issue, as I say, of people living side by side and 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 knowing something more or less about the religion or the culture or the language of their neighbors, that's a different thing from, let's say, you know, what what I'm, you know, the assumption that you can go to Iran today, as you have, as I have. There's loads of books on Buddhism. It's a fashionable thing. When did that start? Insofar as I haven't been Buddhist in Iran since maybe a few in a cave in the Mongol period, as some people have archaeologists have debated. Otherwise, never before. So that's kind of interested in sort of knowledge at a distance. The ability for people in Asia, in part in the Middle East, let's say, to do what we're doing now. You know, we can talk about Buddhism a long way from, must be three miles from the nearest Buddhist temple here. I don't know. Thank you for that 
for the fascinating talk. I had a quick question. Um, I'm really interested in, in the translations from European languages into Urdu um, happening in the late 19th century that you talked about. And I'm wondering if there are particular sites or institutions um, that these kinds of translations and then their printing is linked to. Right, yeah, absolutely. So yes, I mean, in, in going back to, to Naveena's question really about, you know, kind of let's say what the limits of lithography or the limits of this printing, it's really, yeah, we do need to think about who's printing them and who's distributing them. I mean, because printing isn't the same as publishing. You print a book, but it's got to be distributed. So that's a really essential question. So who's getting this knowledge if it's in books and so on? And, and what for? What books are being chosen for what reasons? So the beginnings really, as you'll probably know, is 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 in uh, you know the great beginning really in, in the in, on the sheer scale is with the the Serampore Baptist missionaries. Uh, and the Serampore Baptist missionaries are first of all, I mean, they're doing two things actually. One is translating the Bible into an extraordinary number of languages, some of which don't even have a script at this point, and most of which have never had printing anything printed in them before, such as Pashto or many other smaller languages of South Asia. Um, but the other thing they start doing very early on is, is uh, polemical text, which is why I'm so interested partly. I've got very interested in polemics because of, like I said, my first principle of my methodology. What is, what is the evidence base? And it turned out to be a polemic, something that I'm not instinctively drawn to, but that's what it turns out that was there. So there are many of these polemics against, against Hindu religiosity, against Buddhists, about again, idolatry. But they're also, and this is one of the, the arguments I made in the book, was sort of over a period of time, in order to criticize something, if you're going to do a good job, if you're going to undermine it, you've actually got to understand it in order to refute it. And that builds up a body of knowledge that a generation later will say, well, you know, I'll, I'll read your, your refutation of Buddhism, but I'll just take, I won't have the refutation bit, I'll just take neutrally or whatever, or, or think, oh, you know, that. So, so it is on the one hand, the missionaries. Uh, and the missionaries then start translating quite early on, translating history books, histories of India, Marshman's History of India, for example, which goes through various editions that incorporates more info on the historical Buddhas as it's being you know, unearthed by the archaeologists. Um, but then we have the vernacular education societies and the likes of Sayyid Ahmad Khan. And so we have sort of Indians and, and uh, missionaries or, or company, East India Company or Raj officials. And then there, there are the commercial printers that start to come as well. And the commercial printers are kind of interesting because that's in the case why, why is it that this Seri Barma, this travelogue, this journey to Burma, that's why I picked it up. I thought, oh, great, another travelogue. That's nice. I like those. Probably like, and that's exactly what Nawal Kishore, the commercial publisher, the Hindu commercial publisher, interestingly. Yes, it was. I think the second is with Nawal Kishore. Intended, it's something... Readable. It's an account of Burma. Lots of people are emigrating to Burma at this point, huge numbers of, of Indians. But actually, you know, you read it and it's like, oh, hang on, this isn't a travelogue. This is taking a rather dark turn here. Uh, but uh, yeah, so then there's the, you know, commercial printing as well. So there are those. And then the third sort of element is, is individual printing, of which there's a huge amount uh, to. And it's only actually relatively late by, yeah, 1920s, 30s that we start to get let's say, something that we might think of as an equivalent to, let's say, in the neutral sense, again, Orientalist printing in, in an, you know, South Asian languages with the University of Calcutta. Or, you know, because I'm looking at other Asian countries here, Japan starts doing this as well. And the, the Japanese are teaching Urdu and Persian. That's your Japanese are writing Urdu uh, short stories and so on. And they're being published by a literary society in Delhi uh, and so on. So, you know, there are literary, literary institutions that are sort of doing this stuff as well by, by the 1920s, I'd say. Um, so, well, um, this issue somewhat has been touched upon, but I, I really just want to make a point here that I really uh, appreciate your sort of much more textured, textured understanding of of the interaction between between the West and Western intellectuals and 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 the rest, as it were. So um, it's really important, and it really helps us really revisit uh, uh, Said and basically the fact that he also bought into this modernization theory 
uh, that he was actually, well, he professed to uh, go against. Um, so, I mean, but, and I really got hung up on, on, on your, your, your sort of points about, uh, 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 you know, what was it, cultural uh, oblivion or historical uh, oblivion, historical forgetting. Um, uh, and so I was wondering if, 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 you, if, you, if you thought of other sort of minorities or groups, et cetera, that underwent similar, uh, similar fate in, 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 in Islamic uh, or Islamic hate consciousness. I, mean, I don't know, I might know probably more about the Manichaeans Right. Uh, right, they they would be, or, or you know, so there there, there probably are other uh, perils. I, I was wondering if if those, if looking at the, such perils, without having to write another book, yeah, sure, yeah, uh, I think, yeah. Uh, I was uh, would give, be helpful. Yeah, I was tempted to give a flippant answer and say it's an impossible question because we've forgotten about them and how can we? Talk no, about no, no, no. Was, but, what, but, uh, but but no, I mean, you know, the people have worked. Um, I'm trying to think if there's an American scholar at the American University of Cairo who has written two books about the. The shift from, I mean, of course, the, the name for the pyramids in Arabic is al Aham, isn't it? These were, you know, these were conceived in Islamic eight terms and so on. But there's a, a Donald Reed, his name is, he's done two really thick, fascinating books about how the, within Arabic accounts of the, you know, the discovery of ancient Egypt. So, you know, I used to work as a tour guide in Egypt, and it was always the Egyptian tour guides who could read the hieroglyphics. So you've gone from a point of these are, Abraham's granaries or something, and these Allah to to that, you know, fueled in that case partly by the tourist industry, but also by debates within e Egyptian intellectual and political history too. So that was, you know, an oblivion that that was, you know, something that had been, you know, living on top of the pyramids since Fustat or something, you know, through to 1900, and then, you know, there were these big sort of post Champollion kind of moments, and now I've no doubt there are way more Egyptians. That, that read uh, that read hieroglyphics, and there are Champollion's French descendants. You know, so to me, this is a story of intellectual cooperation. And even though perhaps the the story I've told today is talking about you know ideology or or destroying Buddhas, you know, might seem oh this is a rather dark story. But what I've tried to tell in my book ultimately is two things to make two large points really. And I hope this maybe has some bearing on what you're asking. One is that that insofar as with Said and others, that one actual Understanding another culture is extremely, extremely hard, especially at so many moments because of historical forgetting, people have to do it from scratch again and again and again. That, the effort, the achievement of that, however small or whatever small step it be, is worth celebrating, not denigrating, you know, whoever's doing it. And, you know, the book's dedicated to the, well, the forgotten interpreter, the, the unsung interpreters, I think, precisely all these people who are doing this, whose names aren't the big names, because they're not the ideologues of pan-Asianism. And the other thing, as well as that recognition of just the sheer difficulty within Asia, or indeed you know, across Eurasia, or across cultural understanding, let alone sympathy. So to, to me, so the sympathy is like, you know, you can sympathize with something, but you know, if you don't understand it, it's meaningless. I'm not gonna admire you because, oh, I love all the religious people. Understand them first, do the hard bit, and then decide if you sympathize with what they believe. So, you know, the challenge, I think, is one thing. And the other thing is really to actually, yeah, to celebrate, actually, those moments of when knowledge is shared by whoever, European, Indian, Tibetan, to me, that's, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's a sort of a humanist thing, actually. Um, and I don't know if Said would have considered himself a humanist, despite working in a department of humanities. I don't work in a department of humanities, but I do consider myself a humanist. And, and that way, I think that... What you know, I think the biggest story I hope I've told is is one of actual, yeah, kind of celebrating shared human uh, intellectual discovery. That's a happier note, I think, to go to dinner on, is it? I was, I was going to say that. <laughs>Thank you all for sitting through. I, when I saw it was like five thirty, seven thirty, I thought there's no way people are going to sit through that. So uh, yeah, bye. Stanley Ward audience. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah